we've learned about the biology, the background, and uh, talked about rotational grazing and some of the experiments that Jose has been conducting over the last couple of years. I was going to go back a little bit further <clears throat> to when I first started and talk about the different species and how they react differently or may react differently to Velpar. And basically, just to summarize that really quickly, there's no real difference. They both respond the same to Velpar. So there's really no point in hammering that any much, any much longer. Um, but what I wanted to do is focus more on, when I get the computer to work, uh, some of the more recent um, work that we've done. And that starts here uh, on this table. <clears throat> so you're back in your booklet if you haven't figured that out already. So this was an experiment that we started back in 2008. So let me explain this a little bit because it's a little bit confusing. In 2008, we started with three treatments. The first treatment being Belpar, just Belpar only, and we sprayed plots to just Belpar. The second one was complete renovation. So we sprayed a gallon of the acre of Roundup, <clears throat> tilled it, tilled it a couple times, then overseeded the hay grass, and that was that treatment. The last one was the fall roller chopping. And our intention was to overseed those plots with ryegrass, but we were so dry that fall that the ryegrass didn't emerge, so it just ended up being a fall roller chopping experiment or treatment. All right, so that was in 2008. Before we imposed those treatments, we took counts in each of those plots, and we had about three plants per square meter on average. So we put those treatments out, came back the next summer, and found that where we treated with Belpar had very good control, less than half a plant per square meter. Where we fall roller chopped, that one kind of su surprised me, just as good as the Belpar, less than half a plant per square meter. But dear Lord, when you renovate, you double your population. And I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. But if you think about that, you know, if you sit back and think about it, that's something you should almost expect. You know, you've opened up the canopy, you get seeds to germinate, and uh, you end up with more smut grass. And I think that tends to happen a lot in general, especially when people try to renovate. So after we took these counts in 2009, we came over the entire experiment with a half rate of LPAR, so one quart per acre. And then went back in 2010 and recorded our, our densities and we reduced the population in every plot. So then as we carried that out, we didn't impose any more treatments after that, went back in 2011 and basically saw that our Velpar, Velpar followed by Velpar, we're still holding and that <clears throat> pretty well, but where we don't have any uh, Velpar the first year, but just a half rate the second year, they're starting to increase. Okay, not statistically changing at that point, but they're starting to increase. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> what this one basically told me, or this experiment basically told us, was that you, know, you can do a, a pretty good job with sequential applications of LPAR annually. Um, but if you're at a point where you need to think about renovation, then you can't just spray it with Roundup, plant your seed, and hope for the best. You got to come back in and, and treat it with uh, Velpar or something uh, to keep the smut grass from becoming reestablished. Because this shows you it's going to, right? So you got to do something to keep it at bay. And the fall roller chopping, I've never done again. Um, so. I don't know if this was an anomaly or if this is something that's real. Uh, I do have producers that have done some aeration or chopping in the summer and you, they end up reducing clump size, but I don't think they necessarily reduce density. Or in this case, we reduce density with the fall chopping because we got those clumps out of the ground and they're able to desiccate. All right. The next study we looked at, we had kind of the same situation, except we just sprayed Velpar. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't change this. This is two quarts per acre. <clears throat> and 
And uh, I get on to my student for not changing the English units all the time. Yeah. All right, so we began the study. We had two plants per square meter. We sprayed uh, two quarts per acre. We got extremely good control, um, less than a quarter plant per square meter. But then in 2009, we had superimposed uh, Velpar with or without nitrogen and nitrogen with or without Velpar. And basically, if you look out at 2011, where you have nitrogen and Velpar together, you have typically have less smut grass than you do with nothing, if it, one or the other or nothing. <clears throat> So, in this case, this is telling us if we get our grass, our forage, desirable forage, more competitive, along with herbicide, we're able to keep the smut grass from coming back in as quickly. All right, so I, I think the whole name of the game is, name of the game is smut grass is going to come back in, can we slow it down? And, and that's really what I'm looking at over time. So then the last one um, that we looked at was the sequential annual applications. I mentioned this in the first experiment. And really what I wanted to point out is when you look at two years after treatment, which is this first column or third column here, um, when you compare a quart followed by a quart versus two quart followed by nothing, you get the same results. Okay, so why is that important? Okay, so you spend the same amount of money, 40 bucks per acre. The only difference is what if in year one, we would have failed, we would have had too much rainfall. In this case, we only lost 20 bucks versus 40. <clears throat> okay, so that, that's kind of the reason for doing this. And we looked at reduced rates as well. Um, basically a quart followed by a quart and a half. You go out to three years after treatment, and it's holding pretty good when you compare it to nothing or just one two quart application. Look at that three years after treatment. It's up near uh, where the control, the control plots were. And, and this is pretty common. So two quarts followed by nothing. You go out three years later, a lot of times you're back to square one. I, I think a lot of people have seen that over the years. So that's why I really like these sequential annual applications. And initially, I really liked uh, this one quite a bit until I got out to that third year. Okay, So I think you need to be a little bit higher, probably a one and a half followed by a quart or one and a half followed by one and a half uh, to do an effective long-term job. But even then, it may take another year. So we only did this two years in a row. It may take a third year. It just depends on how dense and how how much uh, seed you have in your particular pasture. All right, so <clears throat> I really like the two-year programs versus one year. And I believe renovations should happen when at least 70% of your pasture is infested. But if, if you choose renovation, then you have to follow it with Velpar the following year. Or it's just going to be a mess within two years. Okay. Jose's covered the, the lethal part about oaks and rainfall is necessary, but too much is bad too. And Jose's covered that really well and he's shown you this picture as well. We also have live plants outside the building that you should feel free to look at. Uh, this same study uh, that he had conducted has actually been repeated and you can see that. And he's talked about uh, briefly doing the same work in the field. And, and that's the data that I'm going to show you now. And this, in this particular pasture that we're going to go to today, um, it is nearly 100% uh, smut grass. So a pretty good place to do a study like this. And so what, what Jose has done is gone out every week from the end of April through uh, the end of August or early September, end of September, on every Friday, goes out and sprays plots. So, and then we record rainfall for during that whole time period. So we're able to track activity and rainfall and, and try to correlate that. So this is some of the original data from 2016, I believe. <clears throat> and basically the take home on this is if you end up, okay, let me set this up. If you have smut grass control here, a rainfall in inches on the right and our days of application, 
across the bottom. This orange line is, is showing you the amount of rainfall. So no rainfall on April 26, result in 20% control. So he showed you one of those pictures where you just get the burn on the top of the plants. And that's exactly what that would look like. You go out into the first part of June where we got over five inches of rainfall, 50% control. Okay, so a little bit better, but still not, not where we want it to be. So that's why we came up with this probably a quarter of an inch to around three inches of rainfall that's needed. And three inches isn't too much, and a quarter of an inch is just enough. Uh, that's, that's where we're getting this data from. So, but you can see the variation um, from week to week that we're getting in, in the level of control. And some of it could be related to rainfall, some of it could be related to soil moisture. Um, that's something that we didn't look at. We did not look at soil moisture the first year, where Jose did pick that up the second year. So we have more to correlate that with. So <clears throat> the other thing is we had questions earlier about um, how long does it last after application, okay? So if we go back to April 26 and we got no rainfall within that first week, but within 14 days we had about an inch and three quarters, all right? So if everything was right, and if we had an inch and three quarters within two weeks, we should expect better control. So I'm not sure that it's lasting that much longer than seven days. It might be breaking down by sunlight before we can even, before it can even get incorporated into soil by rainfall. So we, we still have a little bit more work to do on that to really understand it and, and get a better handle on it. But if everything and the stars and the moon align correctly, I mean, we should know whether it worked within 30 days. Right? That's, this is what we expect based on what we've seen. If we have death in 30 days, more than likely it's dead. If it's still green in 30 days, more than likely it's not going to die. Okay, so we pretty much know that. Um, something that we haven't really covered too much so far today is really the forage tolerance, and that's what I was going to go into next real quickly. So this is some work that was done in the late 90s by Jeff Malahi down in Makali. And basically what he's showing here is the behaviorist biomass with no Velpar application <clears throat> at different densities of smut grass. And once you got to more than 70% smut grass, you had about a 70% reduction in behaviorist. That's kind of a no-brainer. 20 to 70% smut grass, you had about a 30% reduction in behaviorist. But when you add Velpar back into the system, when, in a medium density, you reduce it by about 29%. And then <clears throat> when you get to the high density, instead of 70% uh, a reduction in biomass, you only have about 30%. So that's showing you the, the relationship between uh, the use of Velpar and Bahia grass production to help reduce the comp competition from giant smut grass. <clears throat> Okay, let's skip that one. All right, so then we also looked at <clears throat> uh, Bahia grass per meter grass response over a 12-week period after um, Velpar application. This was back in 2005 and 6. We did this work, and basically um, this is in pounds per acre. So one pound is about uh, two quarts, so if that tells you anything. Two pounds is a 2x rate that's not legal for pastures, okay? So, Bahia grass is actually fairly tolerant, you know, at our use range, somewhere between 80 to 100 percent of untreated <clears throat> as far as biomass production. So, Bahia grass is probably the most tolerant forage we have, we know that, but can we kill it with Velpar? Absolutely, we can, but it takes the wrong environmental condition for that to happen. Okay, so prolonged flooding is one of those, and sometimes just slow growth on the Bahia grass, you'll, you'll ding it a little bit harder than you will during the summer or during the high growing period. Uh, Bermuda grass is much more susceptible, um, and I think certain varieties are more susceptible than others. 
I haven't been able to confirm it, but I, from what I've seen and understand uh, from some applicators, it's that jigs might be one of the more sensitive <clears throat> uh, Bermuda grass varieties. So this was actually Tifton 85, and you basically see a linear decline. As you increase Valpar rate, you get a linear decrease in biomass. So you get lose about 40% uh, of your yield within that 12 week period. Now it does come out of that. It does take a little bit of time, but not, not too bad. I think if, if we would have included fertilizer into this study, we probably would have seen a, a quicker rebound. Okay. The last one I'm gonna show you on forage tolerance is a little bit more scary. So back in the day, uh, when Dr. Mislugby was still here, he used to recommend a quart to the acre of, of Velpar on lipograss. So that was kind of the recommendation I held with. And uh, I got called out to a couple different places, and they were showing me some places that they had absolutely annihilated with Velpar. I was like, well, okay. And I had a student a couple years ago do some more work on this, and I was, was looking at the data and said, well, in 2013, you know, we go up with a court rate, we lose about 40% yield. Okay, I could probably get over that. Well, we look at that in 2014, we lose about 90% of our yield. I can't get over that. <laughs> so um, I stopped recommending it whatsoever on limbo grass. Um, now, if you get in a situation where you either renovate or you spray Valpar and limbo grass, then that's your choice that you have to make, but the recommendation is not going to come from me anymore, at least not on lymphograss. All right, so, but Bahia grass, Bermuda grass is fine, but not on lymphograss. I didn't talk about star grass because I really haven't collected any data on that one as regards to tolerance, but I have seen mulatto get hammered to the dirt as well. All right, so we talked about a lot today. We've talked about <clears throat> Um, biology and ecology, we've talked about the grazing, we've talked about the herbicides, and uh, so I thought I'd talk a little, about, about, a little bit about economics. So this is like me forecasting the weather, okay? <laughs> that's, that's my comparison. Um, so this is some data that was collected and, and published back in the late, early 2000s actually. And this was from that same study I showed you a little bit ago down in the Mockley where they had uh, no smut grass, low, medium, and high densities. And they looked at the amount of hay grass that was produced. So they said, okay, if the hay grass stain was 100, and then 20% loss, 30% loss, <clears throat> and so on. So then they said, okay, so if that's 100, this is a stocking rate factor of 1. And then 80% stock rate factor, 70% stocking rate factor, and a 60% stocking rate factor. The assumptions are that they're stocking one animal unit for three acres, so the weaning percentage is 70%, weaning weight of 550 pounds, and this is an updated price of $1.42 a pound. Belfar application costs in around $45 per acure. And pastures continuously grazed, which I think is important to note, Aaron and mature smut grass is not grazed, okay? So when you look at it, at today's market prices, um, you end up gaining regardless of what your density was, okay? If we went back 13 years when the study was actually published, the low, the low density of smut grass, you had actually lost $15. So at today's market prices, we're, we're actually able to get above and be in the black instead of in the red. All right, so how do these numbers change as you get into the different farm programs? I don't know. <laughs> you know I haven't gone that far. I haven't thought that far about it. Uh, but it, it could make it a little bit more attractive to control smut grass if you're in these ranges of densities. So I know some of the farm pro or some of the programs you have to be at a certain density and to me it doesn't matter. If you're at a low density, let's be more on the preventative side and try to keep it from getting worse. 
So that, that's where I really like to see those programs go. All right, I'm running out of time. So a couple last things, using a wiper. So this is something that Jose is currently working on in his research. Uh, we used to start out a 10% volume to volume uh, solution of glyphosate, wipe in two directions, and do pretty well in most species. Uh, we've done this with broom sedge, vase grass, and a couple others. But what we found is the practice makes perfect. Okay. Using a wiper isn't a science, it's more of an art. And one of my producers I thought was going to be here today, and I haven't seen him, um, made a comment one day at a field day and said, basically you have to put the dope in the tank and not in the tractor. <laughs> I like that. I told him I was going to use it more. Alright, so we did use a 10% volume to volume solution a couple years ago on smut grass here at the research center. and. Uh, you can look across the canal over there and still see this. The smut grass clumps are still there, even though initially it looked very good. So this was about uh, 40 days after it was wiped, but they did come back the next growing season. So we're continuing to work on this. I'm not sure what percentage we're at at this point. We're still getting the collecting the data for a year after from this past year. Hopefully we'll get that out soon. The last major topic I wanted to talk about was using glyphosate as what I'm going to call a selective smut grass control. So this is something that, that uh, caught me off guard a little bit uh, a couple years ago. Somebody had mentioned this to me, and <clears throat> I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so some producer trials have been going on near Okeechobee. So it can be selective because to control behavior grass, we're using four quarts per acre. Okay. So how much for smut grass control? And I think that's what we're really trying to answer. And most are using somewhere between 20 to 4 to 40 ounces per acre, some as low as 16, for the three pound acid equivalent formulation. Okay, so that's gonna be important. The three pound AE formulation is gonna be important as we get to these lower rates. I'm gonna explain that a little bit further in a second. What we don't know is how this impacts long-term behavior grass production and will this result in increased weed pressure overall? So something that we need to continue to look at. Okay, so last year was my first attempt at this. And initially, we we're just trying to actually slow down smut grass at the Seminole Tribe to uh, keep it palatable longer. Okay, so this is, we actually used the wrong formulation. So we used Cornerstone 5 plus, different acid equivalent. So it's equivalent to 22 ounces and 44 ounces of the three pound formulation. Okay, so 22 ounces, <clears throat> we had somewhere between 50 and 70% control if we averaged all of our plots. So that was pretty amazing to me. So this was about two to three weeks after it was mowed. 44 ounces, we got close to 90%. Okay, so, the only problem was we didn't have any behavior grass in those pots to, pots to really look at how it would injure the behavior grass in that case. So that's something that we're looking at this year. All right, so I said the acid equivalent formulation was pretty important. So we have a whole flurry of different glyphosate formulations out there, and they're not created equal because of what I've outlined in this box. The reason this is important is the pounds acid equivalent is because the glyphosate acid is what's really active in the plant. Okay, so that is pounds of acid equivalent. You have pounds of active ingredient, which is all of this together. That's why this number tends to be higher. But this is what's active. <clears throat> so you have to do your calculations uh, based on if people are going to recommend, say, Glystar Plus at 32 ounces, if you have around a power max, it's only 21 ounces. So you have to be aware of that because you don't want to go out with 32 ounces of power max because you're going to end up with more behavior grass injury. Okay, so you've got to check the label. And if you're not familiar with labels, I hope you are because you should be reading them if you're spraying anything. Um, Glystar Plus, it says right in here underneath the active ingredients, it should say four pounds per gallon of active ingredient. And below that, it says three pounds per U.S. gallon of the acid. So three pounds acid equivalent. That's what that means. Roundup Weather Max, just another example. It is 
5.5 pounds of active ingredient and only four and a half pounds of acid equivalent. So that's the difference, okay? So how do you get from one to the other? Well, it's pretty simple. I put you a little bit of math in there. You can't do any weed science without some math. Okay, so 32 ounces, if you're, equip if you're converting Glystar Plus, which is, which is the three pound acid equivalent, to Roundup Power Max, which is a four and a half pound acid equivalent, you just take 32 ounces, divide it by um, the number, the amount of pounds of acid equivalent and 120, 128 ounces or a gallon, and you should end up with three quarters of a pound of acid equivalent per acre. Then you just convert that back into ounces based on the concentration of acid equivalent in the product you want, and you end up with 21.3 ounces per acre. So that's what I ended up with earlier. There's no more weather back. I know that. I was just using an example. <laughs> All right. Power Max 2. Power Max 2, yeah. I saw that. I, I need to be kept straight. All right. So last story, and I'm only going to poke a little bit of fun because he's in the room. So I went down to Big Cypress a couple of years ago and driving around with this guy that I barely knew at the time. And uh, he kept, we kept driving around. He goes, you see that dead smart grass over there? Yeah. It's dead. I don't know why. It's like, all right. I'm sitting over here on the side of the truck. I'm like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> all right. So we keep driving around. He goes, see that dead smart grass over there? Yeah. I don't know why it's dead. I was like, all right, idiot, somebody's spot spraying and not telling you, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. All right, so we keep driving around. He finally takes me down this one pasture and <clears throat> you see this big circle on the right. There's a whole big area that's smut grass is dead. I said, okay, you got my attention. Let me out the truck. So we went out and started looking around and I really didn't know what was going on. But as we looked, down at these plants, we started to see the chinch bugs, and that's what Aaron talked about towards the end. What Aaron doesn't really want in his particular situation, but we did find chinch bugs. Um, we're not really sure at this point. There's speculation that, as Aaron said, that the same thing as the chinch bug that's, that affects St. Augustine, um, but we never got them down to a species level to see if there's something a little bit different. So that's something that they continue to work on. I'm not an entomologist, thank God, so I don't have to worry about that. And then I'm going to end with a little bit of bad news. So also down at Big Cypress, um, and spreading north, I think, there's this, I'm going to call it giant smut grass on crack. I mean, it is much bigger than what we are used to seeing. Um, <clears throat> so the seed heads on this are not that I'm tall, or it's taller than me. So it is a little bit more of a robust plant. I've sent samples off to different herbariums and they all come back the same thing as giant smut grass. So maybe it's just another variant, but when you talk to my Australian colleagues, there's a lot of confusion on the taxonomy of these species. So it could be actually be a different species. All right, <clears throat> two more slides, I promise. So take home. Uh, Velpars are selective choice, the environment's going to play a big role. Grazing management is going to play a large role in our density. Less, less gaps we have means we're going to have less smut grass invasion. Continuous grazing, we end up with more smut grass. And basically having a good grass stand may be our best management tool in the long run. So, like I said, Jose and I went to Australia and uh, my colleague over there, Wayne Vogler, always ended his presentation with this last slide. And he basically just says that a recurring theme is the importance of a competitive, well-managed pasture sword to minimize gaps within the pasture throughout the year, thus preventing giant rat's tail grass, which is their smut grass, seedling establishment from the long-lived soil seed bank. Without a vigorous competitive pasture being president, any attempts to control giant rat's tail grass will be futile. And I thought that was a really good take-home message because, because it's true. The more competitive you have, it, it, the more competitive forager is, the more likely you're going to be able to keep smut grass out. 
Are you going to prevent it from coming in? Probably not, based on our climate and just everything else that goes into it. But can we keep it at bay? I think we can. And I think what it boils down to, and Aaron and I talked about this the other day, is you have to have a plan. And it's a plan that you have to stick with. It's not, some, oh, I'm going to control smut grass this year, and then I'm going to wait 10 years to spray it again. Well, that's not going to work. I think you have to approach this with a plan that's logical and <clears throat> economical, right? Because that has to play a role into it, too. So I'm going to end with that. And if you have questions, let's talk on the way out to the field.